historical geology students. This is um, the second YouTube video for this week. I'm going to cover chapter 10, which is about early Paleozoic Earth history. Now, we got about, ooh, I'd say about seven or eight chapters to go in this book, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this chapter. But I do want to cover some of the basics. So we're talking early Paleozoic Earth history, and we're not going to talk about life or fossils in this chapter. We're going to talk about the positions of the continents and what's going on around the world during the early Paleozoic. A few things you should, you should keep in mind are um, this is where we are in this green area, the Paleozoic era of the Phanerozoic Eon. And once again, I mentioned before that the Paleozoic era began 542 million years ago. The first period of the Paleozoic is the Cambrian, then the Ordovician, then the Silurian. This is straight out of your book. And this yellow arrow shows you what's covered in Chapter 10, which are the first three periods of the Paleozoic, beginning with the Cambrian, then the Ordovician, then the Silurian. Early on in the semester, we mentioned that we need to memorize this geologic time scale. You need to know the eons and what, uh, what, uh, as for, uh, for example, a Hadean, 4.6 to 4 billion years ago. Um, you need to know the Archean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic eons. What length of time do those eons cover? Eons break down into eras. We need to know the three eras of the of the Phanerozoic Eon. The Paleozoic Era, from 542 million years ago to 245 million years ago. The Mesozoic Era, we're going to cover a couple weeks from now, from 245 million years ago to 65 million years ago. And the Eon we're living in is this orange area that's what we're going to cover in the last two weeks of class. And that began 65 million years ago and continues on till now. We're down here now. And so we're going to be talking about what's going on around the world geologically from the Cambrian to the Ordovician to the Silurian. So you need to memorize this for the next test. Cambrian, then Ordovician, then Silurian. In order to study Paleozoic history, we need to memorize certain words. Um, we need to know what an Epiric Sea is. An Epiric Sea. It's hard to explain to you what a Epiric Sea is because we don't have one today. But remember early on when we talked about what a transgression and a regression is. Transgression and a regression. We talked about the fact that when global warming occurs, sea level rises, and the ocean invades the land, so the coastlines retreat inland. That's what a transgression is. During a regression, on the, on the other hand, which occurs during ice ages or global cooling, sea level retreats. For example, during the last ice age, 2 million years ago to 10,700 years ago, we had um, the coastline extend a lot further offshore. So you could, if you walk to where North, the coastline is in North Carolina today, you could walk another 100 miles out into the ocean, you'd still be on the land during the last ice age. So what is in the Pyrex Sea then? Well, when you get major transgressions or major sea level rises due to global warming, then 
the ent an entire continent can be covered by a shallow sea. Imagine what would happen if the entire North American continent was invaded by the ocean. Well, you what you we get is in the Pyrrhic Sea, and the Pyrrhic Sea the um, the depth of water is relatively shallow. It could be anywhere from oh five feet to maybe on the most 30, 40 feet deep. So you have these shallow oceans uh, that covered the continents during major transgressions. And those are called the Pyrrhic Seas. When you went to the Frank H. McClung Museum, you might recall uh, looking at those dioramas showing you what Tennessee looked like in the past. Well, Tennessee was covered by a Pyrrhic Seas during the Cambrian, Ordovician, and Silurian period. It was underneath the ocean, except for Nashville, which we'll talk about later. Um, early on, we talked about the first supercontinent, which was called Columbia, about 1.8 billion years ago, followed by Rodinia, about 1 billion years ago, and then Pinocchio, 600 million years ago. Well, Pinocchio started to break up during the early Paleozoic, so that what happened is during the early Paleozoic, Pinocchio, that supercontinent that existed 600 million years ago, broke up into six continents. And they are called Baltica, China, Gondwana, Kazakhstania, Laurentia, and Siberia. So what we're going to take a look at next is, um, let's see if I can get the next PowerPoint up here for you. So uh, during the Cambrian, the first period of geologic time, here you can see the continents. Pinocchio, which was a supercontinent, broke apart and formed six continents here. Laurentia, Baltica, Siberia, Kazakhstania, China, and Gondwana. Remember that. So, uh, by Cambrian time, Pinocchio had broken up into si these six continents. Laurentia is the name geologists give for ancient North America. So, Tennessee was uh, Laurentia, basically. Uh, so, was all Canada and Mexico. This is um, North America back during Cambrian, Laurentia. Notice it's near the equator. Baltica is Europe. It's the, it's a name for ancient Europe. Um, the U, Britain was these few islands out here, Avalonia, but we're not going to be too concerned about that. This so remember Baltica is ancient Europe. Then we have Siberia, the third continent. Siberia is all of Russia east of the Ural Mountains. Let's take a look at that for a moment here. Um, if you're not familiar with the geography of Russia, let me show you some things. Okay, Russia is the largest country in the world. And You can see here, here is Russia. See that? Okay. That's Russia. There's Moscow. And all the way over here is Europe, is uh, Germany, France, Italy, etc. Here's the Ural Mountains. All of eastern Russia is called Siberia. And that was located right here. Then we have Kazakhstania. What is Kazakhstania? Well, Kazakhstania is the fourth continent we know, need to know about that existed during the early Paleozoic after Pinocchio broke apart. And it's centered around the country of Kazakhstan. Here's 
here's Kazakh. So here is um, Kazakhstan right here. It's a very large country. And Kazakhstan included Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan. And these are all countries in Central Asia. Here's China over here. Here's Russia over here. Iraq, Iran. All of this area in Central Asia, Asia belong to the continent called Kazakhstania. China includes Southeast Asia, that means Vietnam, Laos, Vietnam, uh, I mean Cambodia, um, Mongolia, up to the north, Korea, Japan. That was all in this continent called, we just call it China. But the one thing you got to really remember is this huge continent here called Gondwana, G O N D W A N A. Gondwana is a supercontinent. Uh, well, not a, it, it, it still broke apart from Pinocchio, but it was the, the largest continent that existed back then during the Cambrian. And it consists of all of the continents that are now located in the Southern Hemisphere. It includes South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia. All of those are contained in Gondwana. If you forget, just remember all of the southern continents that we now have in the southern hemisphere are in Gondwana. And that's what the planet looked like during the Cambrian period. Okay, we're going to come back to this in a moment, but let me go up here and mention a few things. This is North America, and we're going to, we're going to look at the world. Uh, geologically speaking, of the early Paleozoic, but um, since we live in North America, we're going to focus on our continent, North America. Um, here you have a map of North America straight out of your book. And I don't want you to get confused when you see this map. Let's see what we're looking at. First of all, let's take a look here and we're right here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, or in La Follette, right about here. Um, this area here in dark brown is called the Canadian Shield. We talked about shields early on. That's where you can find Precambrian rocks exposed at the surface of the Earth. And then these, this light orange area here is the platform of North America. And this is a place you might recall from the earlier chapter. That's where Precambrian rocks are underground, covered up by younger rocks. So here's the shield of our continent. Here's the platform. And, re and also remember earlier on what a craton is? A craton is a shield plus a platform. So a cr the craton for North America is this dark orange area and this light orange area combined. That is what existed of North America 542 million years ago when the Precambrian ended. In other, in other words, another way to think about it is like this. 542 million years ago, all of this area in blue all of this area in blue did not exist yet. Alaska, most of it did not exist yet. California did not exist yet. yet. Washington, Washington, Oregon did not exist yet. Florida, Nova Scotia, all these areas in blue did not exist yet. This was the coastline right here. So the coastline was right over here in the eastern portion of Idaho. The coastline was right up here, right um, between Asheville and Oak Ridge. That was the ancient coastline. You got some other colors here. You got this, this darker orange here. Those are called platforms. Here's a platform here called the Nashville platform, the Ozark platform, the Namaha plat uh, ridge. These are all platforms. I mean, not platforms. Good Lord. Those are domes. The, the, the darker orange areas are domes. The, the, this area here, the light brown is the platform. So what are these domes here in this deeper orange? These are places that were never underwater during the Paleozoic era. 
they always were above above sea level. And just keep bear in mind that Nash the Nashville area was never underwater during the whole Paleozoic era. The Epiric Seas never inundated and never covered up these dark orange areas. These are the only areas that stood up above the sea during the whole Paleozoic. These dark orange areas. The green areas. These are real important. These are called basins. B-A-S-I-N. What is a basin? Well, a basin is a huge hole in the ground. Going for hundreds of miles. Basin is kind of, Imagine when you woke up in the morning and you took this, your cereal bowl out of the cupboard and you put it on your table. That's what a basin looks like. And you fill it, you could fill up the basin with milk and cereal, but instead these basins were filled up with sedimentary rocks. So these green areas were filled up with tens of thousands of feet of sedimentary rocks. And so um, these are some of the best places to study Paleozoic history, but so much geologic history is recorded in these green areas, in these basins. They're also very important to our economy because they provide valuable hydrocarbons oil, natural gas, and they also provide ore minerals, and we'll talk about that later on. These blue areas here are areas that were added on to the edges, what geologists like to say, the margins of North America, which was called, once again, Laurentia back then, onto the western margin of North America. You can see the Cordillerian mountain belt, including the Rocky Mountains, that was added on to the western edge of North America. So there was a conversion plate boundary, subduction occurred, and this was all added on to the western margin of North America after 542 million years ago. This area to the east was added on to the eastern margin of Laurentia during the Paleozoic, and it's called the Appalachian Mountains. This area over here, Texas, Oklahoma, is the third one. The Wachita Mountain Belt that was added on over here after 542 million years ago. This one's not very familiar to Americans, but it's very familiar to Canadians. It was added on to the northwest edge of North America, and it's called the Franklin Mo Mountain Belt, or Franklin Mobile Belt. So these areas here in blue are added on to the edges of North America after 542 million years ago. Now, once again, let's go back to this again. Pinocia broke apart into six continents. Laurentia, Baltica, Siberia, Kazakhstania, China, and Gondwana. How do we know that the Earth looked like this back then? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we know from all of the data paleoclimatic data, paleomagnetics, fossils, stratigraphy, sedimentology, tectonic data. I don't have time to go over all of that data. That would take months. And, and if you end up becoming a geology major, you can study all of that. But sedimentary rocks tell us that this was what the world looked like during the Cambrian period. You've got six continents. Now, what we want to sort of Bear in mind, keep in mind is where these continents are located here during the Cambrian period. And now we're going to move on to the next period. What comes after the Cambrian? Think about it. It's the Ordovician period. So keep this image in your mind. Now we're going to go to the next period of the Paleozoic. See how the continents move. Cambrian, Ordovician. How do they change from the Cambrian? To the Ordovician, how do they change? Well, lots of different things are going on here. Some people, uh, this is, for some people, this is the hardest part of historical geology. Because now you're dealing with all these continents you've never heard of in, in periods of geologic time that you have just been introduced to in this class. How in God's name are you going to remember this? Well, it's not hard. Some people call this the dance of the continents. The dance of the continents. Here's your, 
six people on the dance floor. Laurentia, Baltica, Siberia, Kazakhstan, China, and Gondwana and in the Cambrian period. Then how did where did they move from the Cambrian to the Ordovician? Well, several things happen here. Okay. First thing is Laurentia and Baltica get closer together. Laurentia Baltica move closer together. You can see some other things going on. Siberia has moved further to the north. But the main thing you want to remember here is from the Cambrian to the Ordovician, Baltica and Laurentia move closer together. This narrow seaway between Baltica and Laurentia that no longer exists but existed during the Ordovician is called the Iapetus Ocean. Right there. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the UK. This is Britain in the UK. This is the place which would generate people who speak like this. Oh, it's been a long time since I've seen you students. I know you miss my sense of humor. Yes, you do. No. Oh, anyway, here we go. Okay, so we're going from the Ordovician period to the Silurian period. What happens? From the Ordovician to the Silurian, notice that Laurentia and Baltica have almost collided together. Not too hard. It's not too hard to remember, ladies and gentlemen. For the early Paleozoic, Laurentia started off far apart. The Iapetus Ocean is wide, and then it starts to become more narrow, and by Silurian time, it almost collides. Next chapter, we're going to see what happens next in the period that comes after the Silurians called the Devonian when they actually collide. Now this chart here is can be very confusing if you don't uh, if you didn't understand the part that parts that we've already covered about transgression and regressions, but I'm going to break it down for you so that you can understand it. And I know you're going to get this. This chart here was created by a man named Lawrence Sloss. Who is Lawrence Sloss? Let me spell it out for you here real quick. Um, the man's name is Lawrence Sloss. Lawrence Sloss worked for ExxonMobil. Big biggest oil corporation in, in the United States and he made this diagram here to show the, the situation regarding transgressions and regressions on the North American continent during the Paleozoic into the Mesozoic all the way up into the Cenozoic era here are some symbols that we should get familiar with. There's Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, Permian. So this is the Paleozoic up to here. Then we get to the Mesozoic here, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. It's up here. At the very top is the Cenozoic era up here. But chapter 10 is only from... The Cambrian order vision to the Silurians is everything from here on downwards. And these brown squiggly patterns here, these sh brown squiggly shapes, are called depositional sequences or cratonic sequences. Since the book uses the word cratonic sequences, I'll go ahead and use that. Let me spell for you, cratonic sequences. What is a cratonic sequence? Well, here's a cratonic sequence, and it's called the SAUK, S-A-U-K, cratonic sequence. And here's another one, the Tippecanoe cratonic sequence over here. Here's the third one called the Kaskaskia. And here's another one called the Absaroka. 
These four cratonic sequences are within the Paleozoic era. I'll spell them out for you here. Sauk, Tipicanu, Kaskaskia. Why are they such strange names? They're named after Indian tribes or Indian words. Absaroka. Those are, so you got four cratonic sequences for the Paleozoic, the Sauk, Tipicanu, Kaskaskia, and Absaroka. Over here, you've got the periods. These blue, these blue um, areas we'll talk about later on, but let's talk about these um, cratonic sequences here. Um, this first cratonic sequence is formed during the Sauk, uh, formed during the Cambrian. The Sauk sequence formed during the Cambrian. And what happens is that all of these areas in brown indicate that deposition was occurring in North America. So you can see that this whole stack of sedimentary rocks was deposited in the Cambrian by the Sauk, a pyric sea. Think about that. What happened during the beginning of the Cambrian was the Sauk, a pyric sea, transgressed onto the continent of North America, depositing a, a thick stack of sediments here. Then this white area here means that sedimentation stopped. Why? Because you had a regression. Sea level dropped. And when sea level drops, you get mostly erosion. You don't get that much deposition. Then sea level rose again. And the tip of canoe of Pyrex Sea invaded North America during the Ordovician period and deposited the tip of canoe sequence of rocks, cratonic sequence of rocks. At the end of the Ordovician, the Tippecanoe Aparic Sea retreated due to global cooling, and you formed erosion here. So basically what's going on here in the white areas are unconformities. So you had an unconformity form here, and erosion occurred. Then, during the Silurian, the next Aparic Sea would invade North America called the Kaskaskia, Global warming caused sea level to rise. The Pyrex Sea of Kaskaskia, the Pyrex Sea, invaded the land. And it stayed there all the way to the end of the Devonian. Then sea level retreated again due to global cooling. And you have another unconformity form here. Then sea level rose at the beginning of the Mississippian period and deposited the Absaroka sequence. So these are the four stacks of rocks that were deposited during the Paleozoic. But the first one is the Sauk. Global warming deposits all of those sediments during the Cambrian. Global cooling, regression, you get an unconformity, no deposition. Then the beginning of the Ordovician, the typical new sea, the Pyrex Sea invades the land, depositing all of this stack of rocks. These these are the four cratonic sequences. Now, Dr. Sloss uh, did this to make money for ExxonMobil. They made tens of billions of dollars by studying these four stacks of Paleozoic rocks and the pa um, four cratonic sequences of the Paleozoic and these other ones up here, which we'll talk about later. But um, we can identify these cratonic sequences and find oil and natural gas by using this diagram. Another important thing to see in this chart is the blue areas here. This, these blue areas here represent mountain building, orogenies. And th this area to the right represents the east coast of North America, which we called Laurentia back during the early Paleozoic. And this represents mountain building activity or orogenies on the west coast. The main thing you want to take note of is that during the Paleozoic era, almost all of the mountain building was occurring on what coast, ladies and gentlemen? Look, east or west coast? The east coast. That's where our mountain building was occurring due to subduction 
on the East Coast, we added mountains, which added new land to the eastern edge of North America, the eastern margin of North America. Later on, during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, we formed the West Coast Mountains, like the Sierra Nevadas and the Rockies and the Cascades. Bottom line is, our mountains back east are a lot older than the ones out west, aren't they? Let's take a look here and use our new knowledge to take a look at um, the coastline of Laurentia, which is the ancient name for North America, during the Cambrian. So this is what Laurentia looked like during the Cambrian period. We had one big sandy island. Tennessee is all the way over here. It's under the Epiric Sea. The Salk Epiric Sea is covered, covered with all these areas in light blue, medium blue, and dark blue. And only this sandy island was above sea level during the Cambrian. And these five rocky islands, these five rocky islands are called the Trans continental arch the transcontinental arch this transcontinental arch these five rocky islands and they go all the way they start up in uh, around Ohio and go all the way down to Mexico um, this transcontinental arch only existed during the Cambrian period so this is Laurentia during the Cambrian period when the Sauk Sea was covering up all of these areas in blue. Now we're going to move to the next period. What period comes after the Cambrian, ladies and gentlemen? The Ordovician. So, during the Ordovician period, things changed. Now remember, the Sauk Sea covered, a pirate sea covered North America during the Cambrian. At the end of the Cambrian, the Sauk Sea retreated. You formed an unconformity. And then the next sea to invade the land is what? The Tippecanoe Sea. So now the Tippecanoe Sea reinvades Laurentia. And the situation is a lot different here than during the Cambrian. Instead of having one big sandy island, we have five sandy islands. And what's happened on our east coast? We formed a mountain range here. New land is being added to the eastern edge or the eastern margin of Laurentia. Mountain building activity occurs during the Ordovician. This ancient mountain range is called the Taconic Mountains. You've never heard of it before, have you? The Taconic Mountains. They existed before the Appalachians. They're underneath the Appalachian Mountains. They've all been eroded away, but there's still remnants of it underneath the Appalachian Mountains. Anyway, during the Ordovician period, where there's no transcontinental arch, you got f these five sandy islands. And these five sandy islands are famous for rocks that are called the St. Peter's Sandstone. St. Peter's Sandstone is a well-sorted, almost pure quartz sandstone it's and it only existed during the Ordovician and who owns the rights to this sandstone a great company called Corning Glass probably heard of Corning Glass they employ thousands of people they make glassware especially um, glassware um, for Chemistry laboratories, beakers and flasks and test tubes, etc. Also, computer glass computer screens, um, pure glass. It comes is is made from the melting of the Saint Peter sandstone. It's a valuable resource, and they're used for something even more important: computer chips. The, this Saint Peter sandstone um, is extremely valuable, being pure quartz. It's easy to make computer chips out of the St. Peter sandstone, which formed during what period of time? 
during the Ordovician period. What period of time did the transcontinental arch exist during the Cambrian period? During the Ordovician, we have the St. Peter Sandstone and the Taconic Mountains. At the end of the Ordovician, so during the Ordovician, the Tippecanoe Sea covered up North America, covered up Laurentia, a shallow sea covered up Laurentia, and then it retreated at the end of the Ordovician. And then we move on to the next period of time, the Silurian period, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian. So at the end of the Ordovician period, the Tippecanoe Sea had retreated from Laurentia, exposing the continent, causing erosion to occur, forming an unconformity. Then the next Epiric Sea would invade the land due to another period of global warming, and that was called the Kaskaskia. So the Kaskaskia Epiric Sea covered up Laurentia, and they would do so from the Silurian to the next period, the Devonian. But let's take a look and see what's happened here. First of all, the Taconic Mountains have worn down some, right? They were standing a lot taller during the Ordovician, and now they've started to wear down, and, and, and they're eroding, forming this sandy beach on the eastern edge of this island here. That's all that was above water during the Silurian in the Kaskaskian Epiric Sea. But the big feature you want to remember for the Silurian period is the Michigan Basin. Michigan Basin is real important to remember. This area in orange shows you the basin, a big hole in the ground, where thousands and thousands of feet of sediment were deposited. And, 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 and what happened was... Um, this all evaporated away to make chemical sedimentary rocks, such as containing the mineral halite or gypsum. Now, halite is used to melt snow and is a salt for foods. But gypsum is used to make wallboard or drywall. This is our main source of construction material here east of the Mississippi. It's in the Michigan Basin. Georgia Pacific Company, at, down in Atlanta, Georgia, where my son works, they get most of their gypsum to make wallboard from the Michigan Basin, which is Silurian in age. Now, over these areas here in blue are reefs. These are reefs. Reefs are usually covered by corals. Now, why is it that you have reefs around the edge of this basin? Well, when you have reefs, you can restrict the movement of water into the basin. When sea level drops, these reefs are above sea, become above sea level and separate this whole area from the Epiric Sea so that this water can evaporate out. So often at time when you get these basins and these evaporites uh, rocks, these chemical sedimentary rocks form from evaporation, they're surrounded by reefs. The reefs exist when, uh, 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 during a time of, uh, where sea level is relatively high. Sea level retreats a little bit. And then this area is separated from the Epiric Sea. And then this area dries up. It evaporates, forming thousands of feet of chemical sedimentary rocks. So the three main features you want to remember in Chapter 10, Cambrian, St. Peter, um, Cambrian period, transcontinental arch, Ordovician period, Taconic Mountains, St. Peter Sandstone. Silurian period, Michigan Basin. Michigan Basin, look at all of these. This is a core sample. Um, take it, it, it Drilled into the earth using diamond drilled um, drilling bits. We extract it, and you can see it's made of all this valuable gypsum used to make drywall. Here's the reef deposits. Here's reef deposits, and then all, look at all of those sediments that were preserved there from the Silurian in the Michigan Basin. Now, to explain to you how this works, why is it that 
um, you got these coral reefs around the basin and then evaporation here in the orange area. Well, this diagram show you, shows you here's the reefs, here's the basin, and here's here you're going off into deeper water. Now, this area here um, formed in a time when um, sea level was relatively shallow in this area and the corals could grow and form this reef. But when sea level drops a little bit, then this area here is separated out from the rest of the Epiric Sea. And then during dry times, it can all dry up and form chemical sedimentary rocks in the basin, like in the Michigan Basin. Now we're going to talk a lot about the Appalachian Mountains later on. They don't form into the late part, later part of the Paleozoic. But there was a mountain range that existed before that here back east, and that was the Taconic Mountains. So the Michigan Basin, Silurian Age, valuable is a valuable um, economic resource for the United States and Canada too and um, re reef deposits are around the basin and they are filled with oil and gas oil and natural gas so wherever you have coral reef deposits you have oil and gas why because those reefs when they die they make limestones that are very porous and permeable. That means that they can hold a lot of oil and gas and they allow the oil and gas to flow through them well. What is oil and gas? It's the remains of living things that have died a long time ago and have been liquefied over time or gasified. So another good thing about the Michigan Basin area it is that we have oil and gas found in these green areas. Reefs are good oil and gas deposits and they get preserved as limestones with synidria, coral fossils in them. In the center we have our evaporites, chemical sedimentary rocks. That have, that's where you find your gypsum and your halide. Um, So, and once again, uh, don't forget that the St. Peter sandstone is Ordovician in age, and it's used to make glass and computer chips. Okay, in the next video, I'm going to start talking about Chapter 11. So, I'll see you then.